Thanks so much, John, and thank you, Pooja, for putting all the effort in to coordinate this. Um, thank you all for having me. I'm so excited to be speaking with you today. Um, this is a project that's actually really close to my heart. This was my capstone for my master's program. Um, I took this class on ethics with Randy, and I want to say thank you to him as well. He's been really instrumental in helping me develop this. So this is my capstone turned company, and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit today about Abilitim Consulting. So I'm going to open with a hypothetical. It's a Monday morning. You're tired. You go into your office. You're rushing in. You open the front door. You turn around behind you and someone's approaching you. Odds are, if you see the person on the left, you're going to take the extra moment to stop, hold the door open for them, maybe support them, ask if they need any extra assistance. There's something innate in us that tells us to go ahead and lend a hand and offer help to people that look like they need it. It's just something that we do to try to be better people and good employees and coworkers. What I'd like to ask is the same Monday morning, you're running late, you really need to get to your desk. If you see the person on the right approaching, do you take that same extra minute to help them and make sure that they need any, if they need any assistance that it's available to them? In our ethics course, we had a long conversation about invisible and chronic illnesses, specifically how that plays out in the workplace and also in our academic lives and our personal lives. I myself have an invisible illness called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and many of my classmates had invisible illnesses as well. Some of them were mental health related, some of them were physical, but all, all were outwardly not visible. And a shocking number of us had heard the same phrase either from our employers or from our friends, you don't look sick. So the idea that Abilitim is trying to combat is that you need to have some sort of outward illness that people can see on your, your person in order to deserve support with your condition. During my research, I found that a shocking 60% of adults in the US have a chronic illness. I believe 45% have more than one chronic illness. And 94% of people who reported disabilities do not use any form of visual support. 85% of workers in the US additionally did not feel supported at work in managing their physical and mental well being. And especially nowadays, we see very high rates of turnover in employees. So, this is one area where we can really hone in on the skills and the resources that we have at our disposal to really support our teams and mitigate some of that turnover. There is a Villa team now. So our mission is to support team leaders on their journey to make their workplace more accessible and to remind employees that just because others can't see your struggle doesn't mean that you don't deserve to be comfortable in your role and to feel supported. So after recognizing that this was a widespread problem, I went on a journey to interview as many HR people as possible. I talked to people across all industries, but of course I focused on the publishing industry first. And I found that a shocking number of HR professionals did not have any training in the ADA or the Rehabilitation Act. And a number of them said that although they know that when employees were hired, that they filled out some kind of form documenting any accessibility needs that they may have, they weren't really sure what happened after that. Meaning that once the employees brought on board, they didn't have any existing forms of support to kind of continue them through their journey with the company. After I conducted that, I went in and did as much research as possible at both the federal and the state level to find out what kind of a build, um, accommodation policies were in place, what things were required by employers and companies to support these employees, and to find out what resources were available um, for both the employees and the employers in supporting those needs. And I used all of that information to develop a survey that's our primary service at Abilitim Consulting. And I'll talk about the survey a little bit more in detail there, but the goal is that we're going to look at accommodation trends among the team. And I went through for this survey and I filtered out anything that would either put a really great financial strain on a company or that would require a lot of medical documentation. Many of the HR professionals said that they did use third party companies like Sedgwick and we are not built to be in competition with them. We are meant to support team leaders in using the resources they already have at their disposal to improve their workflow and make sure their employees know they have people to talk to when they need help. And then after the survey was done, I went ahead and did a case study with copy editors at a consulting firm. So I'll talk a little bit about how the case study went. And then recently we got our licensing and we're gonna be launching in November. So the survey is divided into three sections um, and I'll go over them kind of quickly. The first section is on company policy and awareness. This section is designed to assess the knowledge of company policy on accommodations, as well as people the employees should reach out to with their accommodation needs. So this will tell us if the training process and the orientation process are developed in a way where if anyone needs accommodation, whether it's short term or long term, do they know who to talk to? Do they know where to find those resources? So this is also going to be assessing resource visibility within the company. 
The second section of the survey is um, on accommodations by job or accommodations by type. So we found that a number of employees, obviously within the publishing industry, have very, very different job functions. For example, a copy editor that works on a computer all day is not going to have the same needs as someone that's working in distribution or anything along those lines. So for those reasons, we have some sections in this, sub in this section that are for things like migraines, chronic pain, any medical conditions that are separate from the job that you bring to work with you. And then there's also sections on things that you would experience at work that may exacerbate medical conditions. For example, working at a computer versus lifting or standing for long periods of time. There have, there's a third section that I'm hoping we can get rid of in the next couple of years. I really don't want to keep this on, but this is the COVID-19 section. And these are questions related to the pandemic, and they're specifically addressing difficulties your employees may be facing as a result of the pandemic. This might be additional health problems or comorbidities to the pandemic, such as immune issues or comorbidities to COVID-19. Or this is things where you've just really had to uproot your life as a result of the pandemic. This could be bringing your children to and from school, finding care, anything that would impair your ability to work, maybe your normal set hours. So I'm going to go over the case study and I'll show you kind of some example metrics. There are no names in here. This is a, an anonymous kind of situation, but it is worth mentioning that this survey can be filled out either anonymously or not. The goal is, is if everyone on the team fills it out anonymously, we at least get a sense of the trend among the team. For example, if every single member of your team is having the same difficulty, odds are that there's going to need to be some action steps that are taken to make sure that that problem is mitigated on your team as a whole. However, if someone does choose to supply their name and attach it to the survey, we would provide documentation and resources to support the employer to go to that employee and say, hey, I see you've been struggling with X, Y, and Z. I want to open a dialogue with you. I want to be the one to have to start the conversation because let's be honest, a lot of us, if we need support, it's very difficult and kind of uncomfortable to go and prove why we need it or especially without any kind of visible things. We're looking to completely get rid of that question of the employer saying, oh, you don't look sick or, oh, I didn't know. This is going to kind of put the bearer burden on the employer to be a supporting person for their employee. So these are some example metrics, as I said. The first is a mental health considerations category, and this is one of the, um, some of the questions from section two of the survey. So for example, six out of seven people on this team found that check-in meetings with their supervisor was gonna be greatly beneficial for keeping up with their mental health. Um, a lot of them felt that they would benefit from things as simple as a notepad or whiteboard. So we're kind of seeing this trend of these are things that the company already had on hand, but just allowing the continued use of these made the employees feel that they were more supported in their role. Another section was computers and screens. I mentioned this is a copy editing team. They're supposed to be working from nine to six. So that is nine straight hours of just staring at a computer screen. So again, this company, I was able to include standing desk because they already did have standing desks as an option at their company. So this wasn't going to be something they had to go and spend thousands of dollars getting additional desks. Um, but many of them felt that that did benefit their chronic pain. Um, some of them felt that they would benefit from having a brightness adjuster on the computer. So these are things that we can implement on a team level. However, you will notice that especially on this slide, there's a couple of those smaller bars, say maybe only one or two people responded, for example, to things like the screen magnification software. That's something where we'd really be hoping that this employee might include their name so that the manager would have a chance to reach out and connect with that person about getting them the resources they need to do their job. This is a section on chronic pain. So this is not um, labor related. So this is just, you know, work that or pain that they might be experiencing at home or just through their life. So we found that a lot of them um, would benefit from computer or height adjusters for their keyboard, the standing desks again, and then things like having ergonomic chairs. And again, these are things that the office did already have at their disposal. But maybe if we have a company that has a lot of expendable income that's really willing to go and buy those resources, that's something that we definitely, that this team felt they would benefit from. Again, a section on headaches and migraines. Um, the option to wear noise canceling headphones got actually some typed responses where people were saying this would be really fantastic. This team wasn't a hybrid model at the time that they were interviewed. So a lot of them felt that coming into the office was just like a lot of other people talking that the noise was a distraction either for mental health or for migraines. Um, and they felt that having the option to wear headphones that they already owned, again, this is no extra expense to the company, but they felt that it'd be really beneficial. 
Scheduling was a big one. This was actually in the COVID-19 section. I mentioned that this company was on a hybrid model. So they were working, um, they were asking their employees to come in two days a week. It was kind of flexible and their hours were nine to six. However, we saw a lot of response in this section. I'll remind again, it's a team of seven people. So six of these people felt they would benefit from extended lunch breaks for appointments. Some of them had to take their kids to physical therapy. Some of them had to go to doctor's appointments. Um, some felt they would benefit from flexible days in the office for the same reasons. Um, flexible start to stop hours. And a really interesting one was things like breaks. Um, some people, instead of taking 30 minute breaks, they would have preferred two 15 minute breaks just so that they could get up, stretch their legs, go and make phone calls to doctors, et cetera. Um, and this is something that of course, you know, if you're taking months off, you're gonna have to go through those third parties. You're gonna have to talk to Sedgwick and th things like that. But this is something that a manager that cares about their team should be able to implement very easily. Letting people split their break in half isn't something that you necessarily should need a bunch of medical documentation for. So this was a really good example of how the team leader could be really proactive in helping their employees. So once all the survey is in, it gets downloaded into an Excel sheet that looks like this. And then my job is to go through and analyze it as critically as possible. We do use a red, yellow, green model. I call it a stop, go model, um, where we see areas where the company is doing really, really well. And when we see that, I'm gonna highlight it green that means that I'm gonna to go to the team leader and say, you're doing fantastic, this is great, let's keep up this work. So maybe if you're thinking about getting rid of that resource, don't do it, it's going great. Um, and then I'm gonna look at the, the yellow sections are, are kind of an in-between where things are going okay, but there's definitely room for improvement. So sections like that are gonna be the sections where we say, we see what you're trying to do, your employees see what you're trying to do, let's ramp it up a little bit, let's see how we can improve it, let's see how we can make it better. The yellow section too, we sometimes would see where 50% of the team felt that they had access to something and the other 50% didn't, that tells us that maybe there's a visibility issue and that we need to be more, um, more visible with our resources or just make sure that the same things are available to the whole team. The red areas, you hope there's none, but there's always gonna be some, those are our critical deficits. So those are gonna be areas where the whole team is experiencing some kind of deficit that we really need to pay immediate attention to. The example from this company was when asked, does your company use a third party organization to handle accommodation requests? Almost all of them said, I don't know. And one of them said no, but the company actually did. So that means that somewhere along the line, whether it's in the training process or on their visibility on their website, they need to have something that's informing their employees of what to do if that happens. We all know we've been in an accident or we've had something happen last minute. We're just not sure what to do because it's not something we normally deal with. So this is something that's gonna offer support to people who maybe aren't even chronically ill. Then we're able to go through and look at the most common accommodation responses here. We have structural, some tools in the office and just support from the manager. So again, we went over some of these, but the structural things are gonna be things like the standing desks, the ergonomic chairs, the lighting in the office. The tools are gonna be mostly things already at their disposal. For example, notepads, planners, headphones, um, and brightness adjusters. And the support is all gonna be things from the manager. That's check-in meetings, that's allowing employees to be flexible with their time. It's just overall being like an understanding and caring manager, but a lot of that comes from the form of employees telling you exactly what they need. The overall needs that we found aside from the accommodation requests were in the orientation process and resource visibility. As we just saw, the training process needs to be much more specific to accommodations. Many people in this survey said that they don't remember getting any training about what happens if they're ill. Many of them knew the difference between short-term and long-term disability. They did not know how to apply for it. They didn't know what companies were used. So that's something where we were really encouraging this company to go ahead and ramp that up in the orientation and training process. And the second was resource visibility. And we discussed that a little bit, but just making it easier to find policies on disability support. This company did have their own internal website that they used with all of their documentation. And I myself got a chance to dig around in it and I couldn't even find the documentation, which means it's buried way too deep in that website. So that's gonna be something where we sit down with this team leader and say, how do we make this more visible? Maybe that means annual or biannual um, email updates and just letting people know. Maybe that means printing things and providing them to the employees. But either way, the goal is to get those resources definitely more visible. And I'll end with a quote that I use that kind of has guided me through this process that I think is really important, something to consider. And it's that the one argument for accessibility that doesn't get made nearly often enough is how extraordinarily better it makes some people's lives. How many opportunities do we have to dramatically improve people's lives just by doing our job a little bit better? So I mentioned we, we did get our LLC last week and we're gonna be launching in the middle of November, November 15th. So I'm very excited about that. 
Um, we are on, we have a website. Our website has a bunch of resources for employers and employees. It's got some really cool online classes for if you're in HR or you are a team manager, just some quick crash courses on the ADA, on the Rehabilitation Act, anything that a team leader could just go on quickly to get some more information that is on there. So I encourage you to check that out. And then if you have any other questions, we're available on Facebook or email or anything like that. Um, but that's that's the that's what we've got there. And I'll pass it over to Rachel, who's going to be presenting next. And I think everyone's virtual, so I'll pass that off. Thank you. Thanks for your patience as we do the uh, rapid switching, which is never as rapid as I'd like it to be. So hold on one second. So let's see here. So Rachel, you can go ahead and start your presentation and share your screen as well. And I'll make okay. sure you can see it over here. Cool, cool, cool. I just wanted to give uh, the time. So I will just jump right into it. Just give me a second as I also navigate my own screens. So that's always fun. Um, and then let me move this to hit out of the way. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, so yes, I hope everyone had a great lunch and Isabella's presentation was awesome and will very much, I think as was intended, very much tie into what I have to present today. So this is also from my master's thesis. Um, I basically wanted to look at disability intersectionally because I think in this day and age, you can't really not look at these things intersectionally. But I wanted to look at the U.S. publishing workspace with a focus on, ind on indivisible disabilities because um, with the pandemic and everything, we just were presented more working opportunities than we've really ever been able to have before. So a little bit about me. Um, I ex myself experience invisible disabilities of like fibro, asthma, some mobility conditions, and et cetera. I've also been born and raised in a family with both visible and invisible disabilities. So what I'll share today will obviously relate to me personally, but I'm yet only one person on this multifaceted issue. So there's a lot of different factors going in and other things to consider. Uh, so getting into the research, um, some base statistics for disability to be aware of. It's estimated that 25% of the working population is disabled from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, sorry. Um, though this number might also be inaccurate because it included the 65 and up category when considering this, which most people retire at 65. Um, so that was interesting. Um, but in our industry, only 11% identify as disabled, um, according to the Lee and Lowe study that I think most people are familiar with now. Uh, the UN, though, estimates that there's 1 billion people who are considered disabled. Uh, potentially, if accommodated properly at work, 6% 6 of the U.S. population could be working again, which is about close to 16,000 people. And then so the questions that frame my research were really what barriers exist to disabled workers in this industry? How does intersectionality impact this? And then also how did COVID impact the accessibility of the industry overall? for disabled people. And then to be, uh, just to a caveat, I asked participants to, if they align with the UN definition of disability versus the US, because I find the UN's definition to be much more up-to-date and also more inclusive. Some variables and other considerations to consider is that the time span of this study was only about four months and about 40 participants. Um, and I only had 15 pages of content I was allowed to write for this project. So if obviously if allowed, I would love to do more. Um, and though there is intersectionality combined into this study, the focus is on invisible disabilities, partly because, or disabilities in general, because it's often just not as talked about as the other ones are. Um, the big missing data is from people of color, cis males and sea level workers, which we'll get into why that is a little bit later. And the lack of pre-existing studies in the US means that the comparative data had to be pulled a lot from the UK. So some known gaps, and I'll kind of go skim over this, but we can talk more in the Q&A at the end or um, 
kind of as I go along, but vague language in the hiring process and regarding job duties, for instance, what does it mean to be a clear communicator? It's like an often one. Um, does that mean sending out emails daily or is that phone calls, right? Or remote options available, preference is given to, you know, uh, applicants in X area. So is it really remote or is it just, you know, you really just want people in that geographical area? Um, and then lack of understanding owns rights, kind of like Isabella talked about. There's just so many levels between federal, state, and the company. And then a lack of cultural awareness around disability. Uh, so even people who are disabled knowing what they can ask for. Um, and then a preoccupation with maintaining only more, one modality work, work and place of work. So this is a huge source of in, uh, inequality in the sense of like, um, it can take a lot of foresight and energy and resource just to commute to work, let alone considering living in these big metropolitan areas like New York, LA, London, San Francisco, where um, uprooting complete support networks and systems or even moving away from medical professionals that are situated for that person's care can be extremely disruptive. And also it's estimated that people with disabilities need to make 28% more income to, in order to maintain the same level of quality of life as their, you know, neurotypical counterparts uh, or able-bodied counterparts. So again, you're in a big city and that cost of living just goes up, up, and up. Um, and then lack of mentorship in, of people in either similar positions or higher management, which we've seen with other DEI issues is a big issue. Um, and then poor management and planning and creating inflexible work schedules, kind of like Isabella mentioned too, and publishing is kind of no, known for the feast and famine like cycle. So, and also too, it's kind of interesting in the sense that most Americans already work outside of the nine to five uh, work schedule anyway. Um, and most people who experience, or not most people, but a lot of people with, with disabilities actually find that they have atypical times of productivity, like not first thing in the morning, it could be in the evening or in the afternoon. So really, it's just a uh, idea of, are we prioritizing a certain deadline? Or are we prioritizing when we're asking people to work? And then lack of funding of or interest of companies to offer equipment necessary is a big issue, whether small or large company, and then extremely long and bureaucratic processes for requesting accommodations. Some people might be familiar with this through like maternity leave, um, most likely, um, or surgeries, um, but it gets worse. Um, and then I don't think I need to talk about the stigma around being disabled or considered disabled. And then there's the inability to access resources. So again, I kind of mentioned healthcare, for instance, uh, black people in the U S are usually the most under rep, like underserved group in the U S and, but they're also correlating the highest group of people with disabilities that are unemployed, which would make sense if they can't access medical care. And then so I wanted to, with this research, really get into quantitative data because there's just such a astounding lack of it. So for these goals of my questions were what kind of disabilities are prominent in our industry? What intersectionality identities affect that? Um, what was the reason employees chose not to disclose their disability status, which is a big hole in our in, in gap of research and knowledge? And then how many are afflicted with it? How many, sorry, are afflicted with invisible disabilities? Um, and how many had disclosed their status to their employers and how many had passed on jobs due to lack of rec accommodations and if company size would correlate to that and if COVID had created positive or negative changes. 66% um, of participants said that their, their disability was invisible and this was regardless of the type. Uh, participants were asked if they had mental, physical, cognitive, or chronic. 85% chose not to disclose their disability status to their employer. And of that of that 85%, 27% said it was because they were afraid it would impact their standing at work negatively. And 24% said they were afraid of receiving social stigma. And then the number of employees that left their job due to a failure of, to be accommodated at their employment, uh, 50, 15 just straight up left their jobs, 57% passed on a job, and then 28% passed on a total of five jobs. Um, and this may be expected of early stage uh, career people, but actually in this participant size, 69% of the people would be considered mid-career. So three to 10 years of in this field. Uh, so this could be a huge reason why we're actually seeing a lack of mid-level employees in the publishing industry. 
Um, this is not to be unexpected, but of the, in, especially if you look at the Lee and Lowe study, most of the mid to entry level employees are female or LGBT or non-binary. And so this obviously showed up as a big correspondent to age of and gender and being the biggest factors of other discriminations as well that impacted the disability. Um, and the most common age was basically between 18 to 30 to almost 45, which was kind of crazy to think about. And this is also why, again, oh, sorry, I went forward too fast. Uh, but this is also why we were missing, again, the male participants numbers and then also C-level executives, which most, if you, again, if you look at the, C, at the Lee and Lowe study, most of the C-level executives are actually male versus female. So because of the way this survey had circulated, that's why we were missing those data. And then 90% of participants said there were some COVID working practice that they would like to keep going forward. And then I did want to have some qualitative just to get more of the why of all this data. Um, so, and also just to hear in their own words, people with disability in the, working in this industry, why they, what would they would imagine an inclusive future would look like. Sorry for the wall of text that's coming, but uh, when asked uh, what accommodations they had been given, 40% of the participants answered that they had been given none. Um, and the, for those who did receive accommodations, most of it was like ergonomic furniture or scheduling their own deadlines and more PTO. Though it is notable that several participants didn't ask their employers because they said that the answer they felt was already going to be a no or they were afraid of their job security. Um, they were then asked why they thought their employer denied their accommodations. Most reported that their employer did not have a budget set aside for it. Um, and this was regardless of company size, which was surprising to me because I thought the bigger companies might have more budgets to do this, but it was more of a fine line that smaller companies, the employees had direct access to upper management. And so they were usually more taken care of, or they were asked to be more flexible because the company was smaller versus the bigger company they had this issue where um, they didn't have a connection to upper management. So they were just viewed as replaceable. And then negatives of the pandemic, obviously just the distressing state of it, which is not surprising, um, but also for those with extensive medical needs or immunocompromised uh, systems. So for instance, like getting medicine or going to the doctors, all those things were concerning. Um, but overwhelmingly the positive was the remote work and increase of online events. Um, one thing that was, as one participant said, it allowed them to be on a mostly even playing field with everyone else. This helped a lot of people save energy from not having to commute to work and also not having to take time off for medical appointments or being able to treat and adapt around their symptoms while still working instead of having to mask the whole time or just fight through it. And then again, one of the last questions I asked was if they could change one thing in the the industry as a person with experiencing disabilities, what would it be? Or what would an inclusive future look like to you? And resoundingly, uh, the, that accommodations are the standard and not the exception was one of the biggest things. So that was just a theme. So basically everyone should be ava available and understand what their accommodations are, but also ne not necessarily need a ton of HR paperwork to just get it. They should be able to ask and it be given for the most part. Uh, better pay for employees, which I think is just across the industry. But again, with that statistics that disabled people generally need more income to maintain the same quality of life is especially important to think about, and especially more so when you think that most disabled employees are either freelancers or working part-time or have those struggles. And so then they can't have the health benefits that full-time employees do. Um, so this pay is very important question, um, embracing technology to allow, you know, fully remote work or to have flexible schedules as like Isabella had talked about. Um, and then the stop the culture of overworking that is leading to a massive amount of burnout. Um, and then education too, about both what your rights are and also more about the industry and the internal documentation and so on. Um, and that's about it. Um, you can send me questions to either any of this contact information, but I will turn it over to John so that he can talk and then we can have any questions that we need to answer.
All right, thank you so much, Rachel. Can y'all see me? Am I good? All right, hopefully, hopefully you can hear me. But um, no, thank you all so much for for uh, inviting me to be here today. Thank you to John and Pooja. This is uh, this is exciting. Um, I don't know if today it was mentioned, but October is National Disability Employment Awareness Month, and this year's theme is is disability in the equity equation. And I think that that aligns well with the theme of this event's theme of equitable publishing. But this word of equity, it means a lot of different things to different people. And for me, it means removing the barriers so that people can reach their highest potential. But this idea of highest potential was foreign to me for many years until I found accessibility. But as these organizations who had diversity and inclusion program, they started adding in equity into the acronym and they started touting themselves as DEI programs. Many of these programs, I just felt like I didn't belong. And in many cases, I was completely shut out. And so that's why I took the DEI equation and I added accessibility and then I shook it up. And when I shook it up, I got I-D-E-A or idea. And when we have idea, we can then have a sense of belonging for all people. You know, what you may not be able to tell, you know, over the computer screen is that I am blind, but that wasn't always the case. When I was in high school growing up in Raleigh, North Carolina, I, uh, I, I when I was playing basketball and I missed the basket or, or missed a pass, you know, I knew I was never going to make it to the NBA. So I just, you know, I wasn't that great of a basketball player. And, you know, when I struggled driving at night, I thought, I'm just a bad driver. And in class, when I struggled to the chalkboard, and didn't get the best grades, I thought maybe I'm just not a good student. But when I was up in college in Richmond, Virginia, I was just you know, walking around campus and I was constantly walking into things. And my shins and, and my shins were always cut up and bruised. My face was always cut up. And I knew there was something seriously wrong at this time. And so when I got checked out and that's when I was diagnosed with a degenerating eye condition called retinitis pigmentosa. And I was told I was going blind. And you know, the first things that went through my mind were, what girl wants to be the guy who can't see? Or what kind of job can I have if I'm blind? And where can I live if I can't drive? And these questions and many more constantly consume me. And my actions led to me feeling out of college. But, you know, so I ended up leaving Virginia, came back home to North Carolina, moved in with my high school buddies who were going to NC State University. But I was ashamed and embarrassed to tell them that I failed out and that I was going blind. And so to keep up with impressions, I started taking classes through a continuing education program at NC State, where I could take a couple of credits every semester. And eventually I took so many classes, they had to let me into a full-time program and I graduated. And you know, I was still driving in Raleigh and, and it wasn't safe for me or other people. And I knew I had to get out of here. And so I decided to move to Bangalore, India. And I went to Bangalore because I could get a car and drive it pretty easily. And because for me at that moment, that was the biggest accessibility challenge I was facing. But after a couple of years in India, I realized I needed to get back home to the US and decided to move to New York City. And New York had everything I needed. I had a, a robust public transportation system. They had a fleet of yellow taxis at my beck and call. And not to mention if I was walking on the street and I bumped into someone, there was nothing more in New York than just putting my head down and keep walking. I was like, this is the place for me. But during my work, I started noticing that I was struggling to see text on the computer screen. And at the time, I didn't know this was an accessibility issue, but I found this little Microsoft magnifying mouse that allowed me to zoom in on text on the computer screen. And it was pretty cool. And so, you know, this helped me to do my job in New York. I was working for the city of New York, providing financial education during the recession in 2008 and 2009. But when I was looking at my friends around me, they were moving up in their careers, they're going to grad school, and I just didn't see that same type of career trajectory as them. And that's when I reconnected with a gentleman named Steve Clements, who I worked with in India. And he was on the board of directors of a cell phone tower manufacturing company. And he wanted to open up operations in Cameroon. When I found out about this, I said, send me out there, I can do this. And Steve knew I had some sort of eye condition, but he said, I'll take a chance on you. But when the investors found out that I couldn't see, they said, we can't send you out there. And I pleaded with them. And eventually they, they said, okay, we'll give you six months. We'll go our separate ways. So I ended up taking a $20,000 investment. I left Manhattan and I moved to Douala, Cameroon. 
to start this new telecom company. And when I got on the ground, I had immediate success. I took that $20,000 and built a team around me and we generated $12 million in revenue, 2.4 million in profit in my first year. And over the next few years, we, we spread that across the continent. And you know, I had conquered the business world and I felt really confident about that in my three years in, in Africa. And I decided I also wanted to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. So I did that. But my biggest accomplishment was when I was able to read a book for the first time in nearly five years at that point. That's when I got my first iPad. And the iPad had built-in accessibility features that allowed me to invert the colors on the screen so I could read white text in a black background. I could zoom in with my fingers. And all of a sudden, something that eluded me for so many years was now possible because of accessibility. And now that I was able to read a book and I had a track record of running a successful business, I thought I could go to grad school like my friends in New York. And when I started looking at you know, business schools, I thought there was only two cities in the US I could go, either New York or Washington, DC. So I started reaching out to different organizations, like different uh, universities and you know, getting more information about the MBA programs. And typically I got the same re response. I got this email saying, oh, thank you so much for your interest in our university. You can find out more information on our website. But when I sent an email to GW, George Washington University, I got a letter from the MBA office and they said, the associate dean of the business school would like to talk to you. And here I was, a guy who barely graduated high school, failed out of college once and you know, finally graduated, but now the associate dean wants to talk to me. And I talked to this associate dean and you know, it was awesome. She asked me to come and visit uh, Washington DC. So I did. And I, started walking around campus and met with her research assistants. And I felt this sense of belonging that I had been wanting. You know, the city was accessible and sense of belonging. I was like, this is great. And I was like, well, I'm already in DC. I might as well go a mile away and go out to Georgetown and check out their MBA office. So I walked over into their MBA uh, office and said, hey, I just came in from Africa. I'd love to learn more about your program. And the person behind the desk said, you know, everything's online. You can find out anything you want on there. It's like, perfect. Thank you so much. And needless to say, I never applied to Georgetown. I didn't apply anywhere else because I knew where I belonged was at George Washington University. And I didn't know that really how big that decision was until I started my orientation of my MBA program. And when I was at this orientation event, we had nine, these little place cards. We were at the Elliott School and they had these little place cards where I was supposed to go sit and I couldn't see where I was supposed to go. So I turned to the person next to me and it happened to be uh, Liesl Riddle, who was the Associate Dean of the Business School at the time. And she was the same one who had recruited me to come to GW. And she had no idea that I couldn't see. And, you know, as we got to know each other, she encouraged me to open up about my, my disability with my classmates. And she said, you got to be open about this. And so I did. And I started to talk about it openly with my classmates. And I often say that was the first time that I could be my true self. And I was able to open up my heart. And I found love in the program. I met my wife, Nicole. And, you know, even though I was now open about my disability in, in my personal life, I thought organizations or companies would see it as a liability. So I kept it a secret. And so as, as I was looking for jobs during my MBA program, you know, most of my classmates were all worried about their interviews. I was struggling to even just complete an online application. And more than once, this would bring me to tears. How could I climb a mountain? How could I run a successful business? but I can't even apply to a simple job online. I eventually landed on my feet and I, I joined a emerging market investment firm that was raising capital for organizations in, uh, across Africa, Eastern Europe and other emerging markets. And it was good. I got to work from home, didn't have to worry about transportation. But after three years, that company folded and I was out of a job again. And this time I, I had a wife, I had a baby, we had just built a house in DC. And any of you there know how expensive all these things are. And the stress of it all caused my sight to go even faster. And I could no longer see the computer screen. And at that moment, I thought my career was over. And that's when I heard about this software that was developed at SAS, the data science company in, uh, the data science company that uh, was based in North Carolina. And they had developed this software 
to help people who are blind and low vision visualize graphs and charts using sounds. And I thought it was so cool. But the coolest thing about it was the guy who designed it, his name was Ed Summers and he had the same eye condition as me and lived in my hometown of Cary, North Carolina. And up until this point, I had never met another blind person. And I knew this is the guy I had to go meet. And I tried for two to three months to get in touch with Ed, no luck. Finally, my wife said, if he can live in North Carolina, maybe we can too. So we found a house online and we told my folks. And my dad got so excited. He never thought I was coming home. My dad immediately jumped in the car to go look at this house. And as he's driving, he's talking to us on the phone. And he started yelling at something. It's like, what are you doing, dad? He's like, oh, there's a blind guy on the road. Maybe it's the guy you're trying to get in touch with. He's like, oh, dad, please don't yell blind people on the road. Don't yell anyone on the road. And he's like, all right, gets out of the car, walks over to this poor guy and says, are you Ed Summers? And the guy says, yes, I am. And my dad puts the phone in the poor guy's ear and says, my son's trying to reach you. And after apologizing to him profusely, he agreed to meet me. And I came down that next weekend. And a 30-minute conversation turned to three hours. And Ed introduced me to the world of accessibility. And he showed me that my career wasn't over. But he gave me a couple of pieces of advice. He said, if you want to continue your career trajectory, you're going to have to learn as somebody who's blind. And you're also going to have to be open about your disability. And he's like, oh, there's all these organizations that have DEI programs. You should reach out to them. So I did. I started reaching out to every one of them in North Carolina. This is in 2017. There's several organizations, but not a single organization who had a DEI program responded to me. And at that point, I felt like I just didn't check a box that they wanted to check off. And at the same time, I was learning to uh, be blind. And that meant learning how to use assistive technology, like a screen reader. And so uh, if you haven't heard of screen reader, it's a technology that allows us to read listen to text that's on a computer screen. But when I had heard Ed using his, his screen reader on his phone, he was listening to it at warp speed. And I realized that if I was going to learn how to listen faster, I needed to start to train myself. And so I started listening to audiobooks on Audible at 1x, 1.1x, and eventually getting up to three, three and a half x to be able to consume these books and be able to consume this content much faster. And at the same time, I was listening to audiobooks, I started listening to podcasts. And when I was listening to one of the podcasts, I heard about the founder of an organization called Tom's Shoes, this social enterprise where they buy a pair of shoes, they give a pair to someone in need. And I like the idea of this concept. But what I wanted to do was I wanted to make sunglasses because everywhere I go, I typically had a pair of sunglasses. And, you know, and, and I started thinking about this. Coming from D.C., you're so defined by your job. Everyone asks, what do you do? What do you do? I said, if I can't find a job with my education, my experience, and my privilege, what about other people who are blind? So I wanted to make sunglasses, and instead of giving somebody a pair of sunglasses who needs them, I wanted to have them made by people who are blind so we could create jobs, and I could give them jobs and give them hope and give them life, and this generational impact. And that's when Ed said, I got to introduce you to someone. And he introduced me to the president of an organization called LCI. And who knew that the largest employer of people who are blind in the country was based seven miles from where I grew up. And so I met with the president of the organization at the time. And he talked about wanting to create tech-based jobs. And so I decided, okay, I'll come and do that. I started this company for them to really think about how do we create upper mobility and create these technology-based jobs. And I knew from my own lived experiences, the first thing we had to address was the digital accessibility barrier. And so I started, I launched a digital accessibility practice. And I was at this tech conference where I started to hear this gentleman who worked in tech and he was talking about the business case for DEI. And he offered me and went for, for coffee. And so I met with him and he was a tech investor. And he said, hey, I just need to be honest. I never thought about people with disabilities in the context of DEI or in tech. And so he started having people from his team meet with me all the time. And eventually I met a gentleman named Mike Ainelli, who became my co-founder. And we launched a new business called Abler. And at Abler, our mission is to remove the barriers for people with disabilities. And we do this through eliminating the digital divide, which we do through our digital accessibility services. We do that by changing the mindsets of people and organizations, which we do through our disability inclusion training programs. And then we are creating pathways for employment which we're doing through our workforce development program, which I'm so excited about. 
But what can you do is what I'm here to talk about. What are the actions you can take? So when it comes to eliminating the digital divide, think about the employee journey mapping of people who want to get into publishing. Look at the online application. Look at the internal and external communications. Look at your marketing. Are those accessible? And you can have that checked out by asking people with disabilities. Have them to give you feedback. Be open to feedback. When it comes to changing the mindsets of people in an organization, you've got to be educating people, raising awareness of what the business case for including people with disabilities are and why it's going to help them in terms of creating a more diverse organization and the benefits of that. And then when we think about creating pathways, we need to really be intentional, whether that means creating internship opportunities, whether that means providing mentorship, coaching, or being intentional about where you recruit people. But as I wrap up, I'm gonna challenge you all to get comfortable with um, being uncomfortable and rethink the way you think of equity and help others reach their highest potential. And if you do this, you too just might have an idea worth sharing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, John. You have a very inspiring story and it's always great to hear from you. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions for Isabella, Rachel, or John. Uh, do we have any questions from online? Not yet. Any questions in the audience? No questions? <laughs> <clears throat> huh? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, just as a reminder, for the people online to ask a question, please use the interact button that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, meanwhile, any questions here? Well, I guess I'll ask you a question, John. <laughs> Um, so in your company, you are focused on three things, uh, if I remember correctly, digital accessibility, workforce training, and I forget the third one, sorry. So the inclusion, yeah. Inclusion. So um, do you have a particular emphasis? And our, our first uh, plenary was talking about workforce training in DEI. She didn't mention the accessibility part, which is probably a different part of Penguin, but can you talk a little bit about the workforce training and how, how you are implementing that? Yeah, no, thank you, John. This is what I'm most excited about and passionate about. Because when I came, the task I was given five years ago was create a business that would create upper mobility in, in people and tech jobs. And so over the last couple of years, I've been working with the state of North Carolina to, to launch a workforce development program. And we actually just had our first cohort start yesterday. So we had orientation yesterday. And what, we, what our program is, it essentially is uh, six milestones. First, we have to assess the current state of where these individuals are in terms of their technology skills, their aptitude, and, and their, their you know, adaptability. We need people who want to go through a workforce development program because these are, it's kind of our workforce development program is around a 16-week program. It's, it's kind of competing with these boot camps that we're talking about. You know, there's a lot of new boot camps out there. We need something to be able to get people in a kind of a, a kind of a really compact in, uh, course, 16 weeks to get them job ready. So we're looking for individuals who are ready for that. We need to do the assessment. The second piece is if you're not ready right now and you need some support with the technical uh, capabilities, we want to get you upskilled. So we have an eight to nine week program to get you upskilled so that you can jump into the actual customized training program. So milestones three and four, we kind of combine together. Milestone three is a career exploration. So it gets you exposure to industry leaders, uh, you know, professional skill leaders, mentors, and job shadows. And milestone number four is the actual customized training. And our first program is training people to become digital accessibility testers. And then milestone number five is a paid internship. Because this is one of the key things is that it's paid. Too often we've seen people with disabilities doing unpaid internships, whereas their non-disabled partner counterparts are actually getting paid. 
So we made this a very clear point that we're paying individuals. And then the milestone number six is a 12 month support program to help people and also the employers to be able to kind of bridge the gap and help those individuals set them up for success and get into the jobs. So we're, we're super excited about this. And it's, it took two years to get this contract with the state and it would just, it's, it just makes me so happy. Great, thanks. And we do have a question from online. So uh, a question and first a comment. So I'm gonna do these in the inverse order. The comment is that this is an outstanding presentation. Thank you for this. And thank you for sharing your personal story. So this is a two part question and it comes to us from Kelly Robbins, current student in the GW Publishing Program. This has been an amazing panel. John, your story is absolutely gripping and inspiring. Isabella, I love learning about your case study in our ethics and publishing course this past summer. And I'm thrilled that the Ability team will be doing a fully functional consulting company. One of the things I admire most is the focus on accommodations for invisible illnesses and mental health issues. As Rachel noted in her presentation, her survey revealed that around 25% of employees who chose not to disclose their disability to their employers did so because they were afraid of the social stigma associated with it. This is part two. Isabella, would you consider incorporating a similar question or two in the Ability Team survey that would ask if participants feel comfortable requesting accommodations or disclosing disabilities that are related to their mental health needs to their employer? As a follow-on, would you, and John with this company, envision developing tools that might help employers address internal stigmas about disabilities and mental illnesses that might be preventing employees from requesting the accommodations they need? Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. I'm glad that you're following along. It was really great to talk to you about that as well. Um, yeah, so that was a big thing. Um, I also, I, I know it's a kind of just a box you check off. I feel like that's something that we've heard a lot of today is just kind of writing something off as a, a box that just gets a check and then the company moves on. And I know that there are a lot of people that are worried about that during the application process. Um, and that was something that I spoke to the HR professionals about when I was in those interviews as well, as I asked them, what do you do with that information? If you do see someone checks it off and I couldn't, I didn't have one person tell me this is what we actually do with that. This is the steps that we take. So that was definitely something that drove um, kind of the development of the survey as well. And we do have the accommodation section has a mental health um, section and then also a section for attention type um, uh, conditions that people would have that they're working with as well. And a lot of that comes down to, again, annual checks or even quarterly checks where the supervisors say, hey, you know, you mentioned that you have this. So this that's we provide um, paperwork after the survey has been filled out for employees that did mention that they have mental health conditions or things along those lines. And the goal is, and we have kind of higher packages that have quarterly and kind of more frequent things, but the goal would be that once the the condition or so is brought to the supervisor, you set a certain strategy of these are the, the hard steps that we're gonna take to make sure that you have that support. And then it's following up because a lot of times it's really easy to, to mention it once to check a box and then it just kind of gets forgotten about. And if the accommodation isn't sufficient, it's not meeting all your needs. If you never talk about it again, it's still getting swept under the rug and that's not technically you know a, a resolved issue. So I think the goal would be to just long-term follow up and to make sure that people are checking in with their supervisor saying, hey, the plan that we made, it's not working. We need more, we need to do it differently. And I, I, I'll I, pass it over to, to you. I kind of give your comment on that as well. Sorry, John, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll say so, yeah. So <laughs> actually, yeah, so, you know, the, there's a couple of things, you know, when it comes to disclosure, it's such a, you know, it has to be a continuous mm -hmm. process. And actually I have a, a dear friend of mine, Hannah, Olson, who is the CEO of an organization called Disclo, they just announced their product just recently. And it really is to help with organizations with that disclosure aspect. How do you continuously make it possible for individuals to be able to you know, disclose their disabilities in a safe environment and be able to get the accommodations that they need? Um, because sometimes maybe their direct manager doesn't understand exactly what they need. So making sure that they can get the, you know, the, the actual accommodations that are, are required. And you know, but one thing that was really promising, I heard yesterday, I was talking to a, uh, a major North Carolina insurance organization and they just ran a, a self-ID campaign for uh, you know, disclosing um, 
the, the LBGDQ status or veteran status or disability status. And so, you know, they had a 99% response rate and they were confused how high this was. And they were actually checking in with their analytics team because they were just surprised how much people were opening up about this. And that made me so happy that people felt comfortable and safe to be able to disclose this. And that's really important for all of us as, as leaders and organizations to be able to create that environment that people feel safe to be able to disclose. And, uh, and you know, when you hear these type of stories, it's just, it's, it's amazing. And if I may pitch in just a little bit from my research too about why people chose not to disclose, because there's a lot of qualitative information I didn't necessarily go into, but really though there, I mean, like kind of John was talking about, you can become disabled at any point in your life for various reasons, and it can be a gradual process or it can be very sudden. And so really from the point of contact of when you put out a job posting to when that person gets hired and they're onboarded and stuff like that. It really is about awareness too, about making like, and making it normalized for everyone. Right. Uh, again, a little bit about that accommodations menu, right. Is that everyone can ask for these accommodations, uh, whether it be ergonomic furniture or what other supplies that that company has on board or making that budget available to be able to honor those requests but knowing that that's just a very part of that company's policy and ethos, just like a salary would be, health insurance would be, just treating it the same standardized process as everything else makes the ability for employees to be open about their disclosure, but also to be happy at their work completely viable. It's just a question of how that company chooses to instill that. And I've got a question um, for Rachel specifically that's coming from online from Cecilia Chan. Uh, it says, this is for you, Rachel. Could you please recap your research questions? Yeah, I totally can. So um, the main three that uh, really framed my research was, um, sorry, I'm just making sure I'm reading them correctly. Um, what are the barriers to disabled workers in this space, particularly the publishing industry, though, honestly, my research could be applied to multiple uh, industries. How does intersectionality impact disabled U.S. publishing workers? And then how has COVID impacted the accessibility of the publishing industry work for disabled people in general? Um, and that was both the good and the bad. Um, there were goals within the questions and how I framed them for the survey portion. Um, for both the qualitative and the quantitative measures. And I can get more into that if that's what you're asking, but those were the general three principal questions. We have not received immediate feedback from Cecilia, so we'll just take that. Thank you, Rachel. No problem. Uh, I, have, I have one question. Um, first of all, uh, congrats again. Thank you. And, uh, congrats, Rachel and John on that awesome presentations. I have a question, I guess, for all of you or whoever feels able to chime in. Um, earlier on today, we heard um, from Kim at PRH, and she talked about how in the DEI initiatives for hiring, they wanted to make sure that all hiring practices were very standardized because that helped to reduce a lot of biases, whether conscious or unconscious. Um, but it seems like when you're dealing with disabilities or chronic illnesses, it's very case by case. Um, so I was wondering how you square that circle. I would say at least some of the biggest complaints were just like the vagueness about what a job actually requires, right? And so, for instance, it's very simple to just do for an, if you want to do more of the traditional standard, like how you describe a job, right? on a LinkedIn or whatever, that's fine, but maybe include a hyperlink to more in detail or in depth, what does it mean, again, to be a good communicator? Um, or I'm, I think I see this everywhere on most jobs, but like, oh, able to lift 50 pounds, right? Even though that's just, it's just taken as like a standard, uh, you know, language, but really do you need to lift 50 pounds for your office job? Really? Like, I mean, does that, is it really essential to the job category, right? Of what you're doing. So 
there's a lot of that that needs to be considered for a lot of companies, a lot of internal processes that I think will both standardize what your question is of like really looking at what is vaguer or what's more vague and what can we streamline more into a, a clear language. But then also realizing while you're doing that, what accommodations can we say can be provided to in order to execute this job? That would be one answer I would say to that question. I'll jump in also and say, I think that transparency and framing in the hiring process is really important, especially with those job postings. Um, as Rachel was saying, a lot of people don't answer those questions because they're nervous. And there is a lot of stigma surrounding, especially like invisible illnesses, where if I say, you know, I have a hard time getting in the office, especially like after COVID, when people got really used to remote work, that can sometimes be translated as I'm lazy and I don't want to come into the office, not I have mobility issues and I have a hard time getting there and then being in a desk for that long. So I think transparency and like the way that you frame questions. So when you have those options to fill out during your application, saying we would like to know if you have any disabilities or anything you'd like to disclose. If so, we have resources for you, or even something as simple as that is saying that the reason we're asking you this question is because we do have ways to provide you support, or we are looking to provide you support. This isn't a trick question. We're not trying to trap you, um, making sure that it's, it's okay for people to be, to be forthcoming. And also to let them know that once they are brought on board, that your company will take an invested interest in making sure that they continue to feel supported as an employee. And I, I definitely agree that the, can you lift 50 pounds is, is, has always gotten me, especially with the office jobs. It's very confusing, but I agree with everything Rachel said. I would also add too, that you don't have to, like for entry level to what Isabella just said is very important to offer. Also offer that because I think for a lot of people, remote work is offered for mid-level and up, mm-hmm. but not for entry level because they're too scared that like, oh, they're just not going to show up. Right. Or they're not going to do their job or like they have to prove themselves essentially. Um, to be a responsible, capable worker. So also offering these same accommodations to entry level is also very important, I would say as well. Yeah, I mean, I agree with both of them. Uh, you know, I think they hit on the head with, you know, with the job description. You know, when it comes to accommodations, you know, again, trying to standardize everything, I think it's important that everybody, you know, the organizations highlight and, and share all the different types of accommodations that they do offer so that it's not a one-off when somebody does ask for an accommodation. Make it ask, you know, asking people throughout the entire process, what accommodations do you need for your interview process? Um, And I think that's one way. But again, we're never going to be fully standardized because none of us, when we think about that word of equity, you know, equity means removing the barriers, the individual barriers. I may have one different than someone else. And, but if that's kind of, kind of, we have to really address that. And I think it goes back to the, the word of equity and what does it actually mean? Do we have any other questions? Any questions on them? Okay, well, um, thank you very much, Mrs. Bell and Rachel and John. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.